What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. Uh, it's Henry and Danny of Belgebar. How's it going, brother? Pretty good, man. You sound a little hoarse today. What's up? I'm always a little hoarse, man. It is, on average, like 20 degrees here. So <laughs> when that happens, I always get sick. So I'm perpetually sick. Pretty much from the start of December to the end of March, my voice will be sounding like this because I just do not react well to cold weather. <laughs> and before we get started, I do need to give you a brief uh, a brief disclaimer. So this episode is being recorded on Sunday. What's today's date? The 21st or 22nd? 22nd. 22nd. So this should be released a day after Christmas on the 26th, though. Happy Boxing Day. <laughs> happy, happy Boxing Day. Um the other disclaimer that I need to give is that there is the room next to me. There is a room full of drunk people watching football. My uh, my jackass friends are over and they're watching. They're watching football. So you probably will hear background noise, uh, profanity in the background and uh, cursing. And they may your discretion is advised. <laughs> our, our, our business manager is here. He's oh, one of the people. <laughs> our, our business manager is is, uh, is there. So he is probably going to. I gave him the invitation if he wants to barge in and say something on the podcast, he can do it. <laughs> okay. So I'm not sure if he's going to take us up on that offer. But man, it actually feels pretty good right today because the light. I, I finally see the light at the end of the tunnel right now because these past couple of months have been absolutely brutal as far as like time constraint and scheduling. Mm -hmm. I know you've been pretty busy yourself, but yeah, yeah, same. Just to give you kind of <clears throat> like a these fuckers are going to be loud. Let me see if I can close the door. Keep on keep on recording. I don't think there's going to be any stopping them. Um. Just to give you kind of like an update of what we do. So if you guys don't know, um, we both have jobs outside of this podcast. <laughs> I don't know if we're supposed to like it. You know, sometimes I'm a little worried about disclaiming it because there's a lot of crazy people. But I've been really busy lately uh, with other things that I've been working on. In addition, I've actually been doing contract work with. I can't disclose this information, but I will tell you I've been doing contract work with um, regarding the NFL and a major broadcasting station. And that's finally ended. So I have a lot more free time to just be a normal human again and not spend every single part of my life either working or researching or recording or editing this podcast, which is finally which is finally nice which gives us more time to concentrate on making better content and all that stuff. But today is not going to be one of those episodes. <laughs> yeah, today is not going to be one of those episodes. We want to get something out uh, just because we want to keep the flow of every Thursday, have an episode. We've been on a pretty consistent streak over the past uh, several over 90 months, days, really, yeah. several months since August. Several we've, months, yeah. we've really been going on this schedule. So if you're going to go by this schedule, sometimes you got to work with what you have. And right now I'm working with a bunch of drunk assholes outside my door, <laughs> screaming and yelling about God knows what, because obviously they're all gambling on these games. And um, <laughs> you're going to hear a lot of frustration and a lot of cheering, and um, which is great. What's also great is that the Jets won. Okay. And I don't know if you know, Danny, but... I don't, I don't, but continue. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if our audience knows, but like, I'm a hardcore NFL fan. I'm a very big NFL fan, and I'm a very big Jet fan, which is terrible because the Jets are usually disappointing. Terrible. I mean, they're not terrible as in like <laughs> Bengals ter terrible, but they're they're bad enough where there's sometimes you have a little bit of hope, and then you realize that they're the Jets. You know, there's always kind of an expectation of them being okay. And they always kind of uh, flip that on the head and they're okay in a very mediocre way. So it's always a little bit of a disappointment, but I'm happy the Jets beat the Steelers today. So I'm in a terrific mood. Um, you know, a project that I've been, I've been kind of, you know, down the line. And, and I guess here's, a, here's a, a good time to talk about like future bro history episodes and future pro, uh, projects. You know, as you guys know, we, we concentrate mainly on history, foreign policy, foreign policy mostly, 
uh, just because there's a lot of relevant stuff to talk about. And doing a history podcast takes a lot of time. Um, doing like a strict history podcast takes like, for example, that Sykes Pico episode that we did a couple months back. Right. Uh, the Toyota Wars time. episode that we did a couple be- couple months back. Those took about 10 hours of research combined between both of us to, to put yeah. those episodes out. Like Mi- Minimum, really, yeah. Mi- minimum. I mean, in, in addition to just the ongoing research that we do on these topics, when we're nailing down one specific topic and we're trying to explain it like that, it takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of research. And hours of reading books. You got to read multiple sources. You got to read multiple articles. You got to find multiple articles. It takes a lot of damn time. So the foreign policy stuff is just easier to kind of go because there's kind of like a continuous story that you're following, if you know right. what I mean. Right. So obviously more of that. Um, I've been toying around doing a football podcast in the future. <laughs> um, I don't know if I've, I don't think I've, you're, this is probably the first time you're hearing it. Danny, yeah, but, totally. Um, I have a buddy who's a really talented NFL analyst and, and sports writer. Um, and he writes, he writes about the jets and we've been talking about doing a show. Um, or, or at least kickstarting a show to see to see where it goes. Now that we have more free time, who knows? That could be a project. Maybe just, there could be some type of sports element brought into bro history. I'm not sure if you guys would like that or not, or if you want to hear my opinions on sports. However, I had this idea today. Before we get into the main topic, which is going to be about the defense bill and maybe even impeachment, I don't know. We're, we're, we're definitely freestyling today. We're working on it. We're, we're working on it. So the NFL had an epiphany about a different way or a new way to s- fucking sirens. A new way to stop the sirens? A new way to stop the sirens, which will never happen. So the epiphany I had is that you create a video archive of all NFL games throughout a season and what you do is that like maybe Disney can do it uh maybe they can broadcast all the games that they have on their on their uh Monday night footballs and they can broadcast them uh they can they can have a video archive on their Disney streaming platform and with that you can watch those games within different angles, like different different camera angles. So instead of the normal side view that's broadcasted by every, which is like the standard, you can mm-hmm. select doing a behind the behind a quarterback view, maybe behind a safety view, um, pinpointing like specific players for fantasy or for people who want to just like look at specific players or for scouting. Like you could do that for college football as well for scouting and things like that. I don't know. I, I, I thought that was a brilliant idea on my part, like having the ability to collect video archives of all the NFL games, or at least some NFL games, you know, enough for at least one team where you can watch or pinpoint different players and like you know if there's like a marquee player like Lamar Jackson like have like okay we're gonna pin pack and just zoom in on Lamar Jackson see his footwork and stuff like that you know get a real sense of like his release and stuff um, if you want to do it like with Mark Ingram or somebody like you know I think it'd be good for fantasy it'd be good for for handicappers and it was just a, it's just a better way I, I think it's it's fun to watch football and behind a camera view I, I enjoy, like like in Madden so I don't know I did an epiphany <laughs> if I had millions of dollars I'd work on that project well uh, I mean personally speaking I'm not a really big football fan but I, I am don't a like big, sports but I am a big tech fan and it sounds really cool to be able to like explore and, and see that I would even go a step further and, and see if you can like introduce maybe vr or something crazy shit like that so that you can like get like an on the field you know perspective i think that'd be super cool it'd be it would be cool but i'm thinking i'm thinking in terms of people who are gambling on games Mm -hmm. if you want to do like a hardcore analysis on a specific player i think having the ability to to have like a pinpoint camera view of a player like if you want to watch like Michael Thomas, the, a wide receiver on the Saints, and you just want to like, you know, you want to see everything he does. You want to get like a, a really good view of the routes that he's running, or if you want to, 
because you know you can't see the the wide receivers uh, end their routes a lot of the times because the camera is always focused on the quarterback. So you don't really see where the receivers lo- like where he is until the ball is released and the camera right. follows the ball. So mm-hmm. I enjoy watching like wh- wh- if when I go to an NFL game or when I go to a football game, um, I always just love the chance to, to like watch the route running and stuff and how safeties and corners are playing are, are playing um seeing seeing if a quarterback missed an open receiver because you can't see that when you're just watching it on fox right so i don't know that was an idea that i had i don't know i don't have the millions and millions of dollars to introduce or pitch that to anyone <laughs> and setting up the infrastructure or something like that would cost millions and millions of dollars but if but anybody's figured, listening and wants to invest yeah. <laughs> and, and also it's like with with the nfl and sports uh, in general you know there's 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 advertising all over that field and there's different you know where they're placing advertisements um on the stadium or you know whether it be somewhere in the bleachers or somewhere else um they're paying for that space and it's based on the amount of time that space is being filmed on tv so you'd have to sort that out but i was thinking that you could do it like programmatically you know what i mean like if you want to switch camera views and you have to like you have to sit through an ad, like a YouTube video or something. Like you switch a video, you have right. to, you lo- an ad loads up. Or you do a freemium model that it allows for like... Uh... Yeah, a subscription service where you don't have to pay for ads. And then you could do, if you want to switch from, from let's say, um, you know, Lamar Jackson, Kingram, um, then you could, you'd just be like, okay, you'd have to watch this 30 second ad, like Hulu or something like that. Right. I don't know. That it's was almost just some... like it's almost like like uh, you know when you play like a Madden game, for example, right? And you want to go back and watch the the watch the game from the perspective of a particular player. It's like basically like almost gamifying the actual game itself, right? Like turning turning the real life game into almost like a video game. Because there there's plenty of. I think it hits so many aspects. Um, if you did that in college as well, you couldn't do that with every single college game, obviously, but it'd be a great way to, I mean, college NFL scouts have ways to scout these players. They're at the games, they're watching them in person, but I think it'd be a great way for the average fan to, to uh, or the average better, uh, or even fantasy football player, which is not betting. Um my girlfriend won her fantasy football league. <laughs> I lost mine, but she won her. She won her league. That's which funny. Is, which is which is great. She won a lot of money too. Um, I, I I was in first place until I lost in the first round of playoffs. But I was in first goes. place until I was not. <laughs> I was in first place until I guess got demolished in the, in the playoffs. But there's my football rant. All right, let's get on to the actual topics that we want to speak about. Um, besides the subtleties um so impeachment i guess was is the thing that's been dominating the news and the headlines and all this and that and that's right dude i have been checked out on impeachment for a really long time um i've been checked out on impeachment since we did that episode on impeachment <laughs> you've been checked and out on impeachment out, since before <laughs> i was i was checked out on impeachment even prior to that episode. Right. So it was like, I, I don't know, behind the scenes, it was like pulling teeth. Danny had to pull my teeth out for us to, for, for me to do that episode. <laughs> um, those episodes on Ukraine and impeachment, I was just like, fuck, I fucking hate this shit. I hate it. Um, but here's my analysis. So, you know, Trump has been impeached. Meaning that he's no longer president of the United States, right? No, that's not. <laughs> that's, you see all the idiots on Twitter who are yeah. like, oh, the Trump's no longer president. Ha, 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 ha. I'm sure uh, all of the liberals l- would like to think that, but that is not the case. So uh, basically what has to go down is it's it needs to head over to the Senate, which, by the way, they've, they've held off on doing. Uh, so Pelosi basically... Um, is uh, withholding the uh, the articles of impeachment until she can figure out which are going to be the managers of the impeachment, you know, and what the rules are going to be. Because, you know, a lot of people might not know this, but there aren't like hard and fast rules about how to try uh, an impeachment in the Senate. They pretty much make, make up those rules as they go, uh, which is 
fucking crazy to me but i guess you know the the, the founders left it you know uh, uh kind of open enough for us to figure out the rules in, in general and i guess they didn't have the foresight to think like hey well maybe <laughs> maybe we'd run into some of these problems but i mean it, you could see it as a positive point uh too you know um there are people on on both sides of the aisle that either want an impeachment that includes like witnesses and and you know more testimony and things like that and that could you know help us to get to the truth there are people on the other side you know that that uh, on both sides of the aisle, frankly, that just want an expedient trial, just get get it over with, vote on whatever it is that we already know based on the House's impeachment. Um, and there's pros and cons to both of them. But what's funny is that Trump, at at least at one point, has advocated for for both uh, options. <laughs> so like, I guess he's open for whatever. Um, but I think right now what what, what we're at is um, Pelosi is looking for you know a fair trial in the Senate. I know a lot of uh, especially minority members, Democrats in the uh, Senate, are looking for you know more uh, um, more uh, testimony. They want, they There's want a, more testimonies and more yeah, witnesses. They, they, they want more testimony, more witnesses. And I think it, it, you know like whichever way you look at it, I don't necessarily think think it would be a bad thing to talk to some of the the key people you know your boltons and your uh mulvaney's and and folks that you know literally had something to do with the articles of impeachment the, the counterpoint to that is well you should have figured that shit out before you voted on the impeachment so like I, i'm on the fence about it like you know what's done is done the man is impeached that'll forever be you know part of the record um whether or not this impacts his re-election or not positively or benefit um positively or negatively is is up for debate and we'll find out we'll see as 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 uh, Trump likes to say. Um, but generally speaking, where we're at right now is we have to wait until the House kicks over this information to the Senate. Uh, and then the Senate has to come up with all these rules about like, what kind of trial are we doing? Who are the managers of this um, impeachment process? You know, uh, how quickly are we going to do it? Are we going to make it televised? Are we going to make it, you know, behind closed door? Like, what are all the what are all the nitty gritty? So that hasn't happened yet. When that happens, then we'll have to uh, uh, see. We'll probably talk more about it in the future. But uh, when that happens, then they'll vote on it. The Senate will vote on it. And uh, if they vote to convict on either of the charges, then the next steps would be removal of the president. Um, but the likelihood is, and you know, the word on the street and the obvious writing on the walls is that you know the Senate has a big majority uh, of Republicans that support the president for better or for worse. Uh, and, you know, because the House vote basically passed on party line, you know, we saw like, I forget the actual numbers, but it was basically all of the Democrats minus three and uh, voted yes. And all of the Republicans minus one uh, voted no. So, you know, the likelihood that, that the outcome is going to be exactly the same in the Senate. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. No, the president is still the president and, you know, there are bigger, uh, you know, well, I don't know about bigger, but there are other things to do, uh, in the interim. So we'll see what happens. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to rebuttal you real quick. I just need to tell these assholes to shut up for a second. Cause I have a, I'm going to, I don't want to, I don't want the background noise to come in. Okay. Guys, I'm doing my podcast. <laughs> um, I'm about to go on a, on a tangent, so just try to keep falling down for for ten for ten minutes, please. Just, just, I'm about to go on a very racist rant. I don't know if you caught any of that. I'd love to have permission to keep that in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh, um, all right. So, um, I mean, this impeachment has really off put a lot of people, including myself. It definitely brought out my inner right winger. Um, I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. Um, there was a Reuters poll that was released the day after Trump was impeached, saying that most Americans don't favor impeachment, or they not that not necessarily impeachment. But it was phrased they don't want him removed, they don't want Trump removed from office. Um, I think the Democrats have really, really kind of tarnished them, their their reputation of just creating this political theater for really no other reason than disagreeing with Trump politically and not liking him politically because Trump wasn't convicted of anything um what he it's nothing convicted of anything uh, criminal and really they're 
that they have been looking for a way to impeach him ever since he's been elected. So any type of scandal, minor or major, would have been brought up. And they came off looking really, really bad. And the people who are the big spokespeople, such as Adam Schiff and Maxine Waters, if you saw her fucking speech the other day, which was kind of made me barf. Two of the most corrupt people in American politics, Adam Schiff and Maxine Waters. Like, I don't even know where to begin with Maxine Waters and how corrupt she is, but she is one of the most corrupt people in American politics, and she's she's grandstanding, and she's literally lecturing people about how Trump needs to be, you know, the, the Trump is corrupt and all this stuff. I'm like, lady, you are the epitome of, of government gloat, of, uh, of bloat. Um, Adam Schiff is just a warmongering arms lobbyist hawk, uh, who's totally in bed with just arms lobbies and, and embedded with with elements that people like to call the deep state. Um, I think it looks really, really, really bad on on the Democrats' part, and I think even the middle in the road liberal is getting frustrated with it. Uh, for example, like my girlfriend is a registered Democrat. Um, she's uh, not how's that work o- out? Over. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's fine. Like we don't talk that much about politics. Um, most of my relationships outside of this show have really nothing to do with politics. Like it's not something I, I bring home with me per se. And she was, she didn't vote for Trump. She doesn't like Trump. And she was like, I might vote for Trump after this. And like, she's like, I'm so, I'm so frustrated with this. It look, it seems like such horseshit and like they're out to get them. Like I might even vote for Trump, like out of spite. Um, so it's affecting the, the major, I think it's really going to hurt them within their own party. Um, the Democrats have really put themselves in a position where they're just anti-Trump and they're ignoring, they're ignoring what their voting base actually wants. And I'm not endorsing these, but a lot of Democratic voters, they typically are in favor of things like, you, you know, like wage laws, environmental laws, um, um, Health care. They're ignoring a lot of the demands from their own party. And what what's happening with the with the DNC is that they're catering to the very loud anti Trump activist, and they're doing it based off like Twitter followers and Twitter and tweets. And they're listening to the activists within their party, which is really going to damage them in the long run because most act the activists within your party do not represent the larger. You know the, the the larger constituents in your party. Uh, most people aren't activists. Most people aren't either extremely liberal, liberal or extremely right wing. Most people are pretty middle in the road when it comes to politics in the United States. And you're alienating that voter block. And I think it's going to create a lot of resentment. And I think that's why Pelosi it, it was. I mean, this is being released. This is going to be released like four days down the road. So things can completely change. Um, Pelosi doesn't want to bring that to Senate, and they're saying it's going to be because it's unfair i think it's because they know that it's 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 has done political damage to the democrats and they're trying a way to back off from it because it's just they they did not look good and it's not just coming from me who's you know kind of a libertarian-esque right-wing type of guy it's coming from people who are within the old within the democratic party like not a lot of people hate trump but like a lot of people don't eat uh eat breathe and sleep i hate trump like not everyone is an anti-resist is a resistance activist and the democrats seem to think that all of their voters are that which is kind of an insult to their own party and kind of an insult it's kind of like they i would be insulted if like everyone thought that a republican was just like a super crazy tea party uncle your uncle who who shares right wing memes like is this not i i think they i really think they're they do not have a good temperature on on what most americans are thinking and they've got lost in following the activist within their party and it's leaving them completely directionless and i think that this is probably going to be good for trump in the long run um i don't think trump wanted to be impeached 
because no one wants to be impeached. It is a tarnish on your legacy. Like people are always going to remember Trump was impeached. People are always going to remember that Andrew Jackson was impeached. People are always going to remember that Bill Clinton was impeached. And they're yeah, not for, good for, things. For some of those three presidents, you know, like that's pretty much all people know about Andrew Jackson. You know, like oh yeah, that was the guy who got impeached, right? H- however, now what you're doing to Trump politically is that you're uniting the moderate. Everything from the hardline right winger to the moderate right winger to the just moderate independent who thinks that the impeachment process was just kind of like like a total farce. You're uniting them together to create one large voting block. And like this is what I was saying from the very from the very beginning, like when, you know, when the, the election season kicked off. The, what Trump has now that he didn't have before when he was running in 2016 is that he has the support of the majority of the Republican base. And that base goes from everything from your middle of the road conservative to your guy who works on Wall Street to your guy who, you know, just family man who lives in South Carolina. You know, those are kind of like the foundations of like the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Um, They're uniting all those coalitions together. And I think he's going to have a really big voting block. Um, so I think that you put him in a position where he looks like a victim of an unfair kind of witch hunt and that's, it's going to unite people to, to, to embrace and vote him, it, especially if the, if there's no recession between now and, um, like, I think the biggest threat to Donald Trump's presidency, if there is a financial crisis between now and the election, which could very well happen, which is a complete possibility. Um, but if there is no financial crisis, then I do not think that he will. Re- I think this is definitely kind of a win for Donald Trump. Well, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I'll <clears throat> yeah, there are many things that you said that I disagree with. Go figure. But there are a few points that I can that I can come to the middle ground with you on. Uh, I would say that uh, I dislike the fact that, uh, you know, we move forward with uh, an impeachment proceeding with absolutely, well, not absolutely, but m- basically no bipartisan support. I think, you know, it's it's kind of written in the uh, Federalist Papers that impeachment shouldn't be used, you know, for partisan um, reasons. That being said, though, I think what uh, I think that the the proceeding, the impeachment um, and at least asking the questions was totally was totally fair. Uh, I don't think that we should ever get into a situation where we, you know, allow uh, kind of abusive power or even the question of abusive power to go un- unasked, you know, uh, because, you know, we, we should definitely have a system of checks and balances. You know, I definitely think there was some shifty shit that was going on, you know, uh, the extent of which, you know, whether it was criminal or not is at this point remains to be seen. It still has to like he still has to be convicted in order for us to say, yes, that this was criminal. This is, you know, worthy of removal. But at the very least, you know, uh, I think that um, we should definitely ask the questions. We should definitely do these things because I think it sets a really bad precedent for, you know, all the presidents moving forward, right? We don't want to set up a situation where, okay, all of the, you know, loud Trump people, they get, si- you know, anti-Trump people get silenced. Uh, and, you know, a couple of years down the line, we've got a, you know, a democratic version of Trump, you know, that does equally, you know, annoying and, you know, uh, uh, deplorable shit. Uh, and then, you know, we've already set up the precedent that, no, it's totally OK to just let this happen and we shouldn't ask any questions and we shouldn't at least do an investigation and think about some of those things, because I think that's that's a part of the systems of checks and balances. So to be fair, uh, I don't necessarily think that the going through the process was a bad idea. I definitely think going through the process and not having bipartisan support was a bad idea because, as you say, it does make the, the Democrats look bad. It does lend some credence to the idea that there is a witch hunt. Do I think that the, it was a witch hunt? Absolutely not. Um, but that's not what the common Republican voter is thinking, you know, especially think, after think, this process. I, I, you think, know? I think many the common Republican voter is absolutely thinking that this is a witch hunt. Right. And, and, and many independents and even people who are on the who are on the left think it's a witch hunt. Like, right. I think you underestimate how many people think that this was complete bullshit. Oh, I, I don't I don't <laughs> think you then then I don't think you've heard me very well. You know, I, I actually do think that that, you know, the the process of this as as 
partisan as it was, did have that effect. I actually quite agree with you. Um, do I think that the process should have never happened? No. I, I, in, that, in that respect, I disagree with you. I definitely think that um, other more stable, maybe more bipartisan leaders should have taken up this, this issue and, and done a better job at making sure that, you know, that it was a fair um, that it was a fair allocation. You know, uh, there were some Republican talking points that were going around about like how they didn't get uh, uh, minority um, uh, uh, um, benefits, like being able to question their own witnesses and things like that. And I haven't looked too deeply into that, but you know, even if if those allegations are half true, you know, then in that case, I think that's a that's a perfect opportunity to 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 recalibrate the system. And and I think that there should have been some some privileges afforded there. However, you know, there was a lot of motion, you know, from you know Nancy Pelosi at least, you know, to make it as uh, uh, fair as possible. I mean, you know, one of the one of the uh, the talking points while we were doing the inquiry before the impeachment articles were uh, written up was that it was all happening behind closed doors, you know, and that no, the American people had a right to know about it, you know, and uh, you know, there's there's some validity to that, and then you know, well. They made a bunch of uh, uh, interviews public, right? I also find it extremely suspicious um, and 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 very troubling, frankly, that a lot of key witnesses, you know, Trump was literally blocking them. You know, uh, one guy, what was his name? I forget his name. On the Republican side, you know, made a very rousing speech during the vote. Um, some of the things I, I followed and some of the things I didn't. Um, but one of the points that I thought were pretty strong was that, you know, uh, in this system of jurisprudence in the in the United States, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty. And and the idea that he has to come and testify is like a, you know, um, it, it, it's like turning jurisprudence on its head and saying you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And while I generally agree with those sentiments, this uh, uh, proceeding is not necessarily uh, a judicial one. Right. It's not law. It's a political one. That's what impeachment is. It is a political remedy. It is a tool that politicians use to serve the system checks and balances so that we don't have, you know, an authoritarian dictator take over the presidency. And so in that respect, I think, you know, it was it, you know, love him or hate him. But Bill Clinton testified, you know, um, Bill Clinton definitely uh, uh, had pushback on releasing documents and on releasing um, and and having people testify as well, but ultimately even Nixon did this shit. You know they pushed back on on the impeachment proceedings as well, and I think every president has the right to push back. You know because this is a very you know big uh, allegation. Nevertheless, though they they ultimately did provide the documents. They ultimately did provide the testimony. And you know when it comes down to it, Trump didn't. You know and and it still remains to be seen. Like right, we we might still have a a Senate trial where maybe Trump will speak or give a written. Um, uh, testimony. Maybe he'll allow uh, um, or direct his his people to to come in and testify to his to his aid. I think if he doesn't, then we might see a different um, we might see a different outcome. I think this will be equally damning for um, you know the folks that that are now believing that this is a witch hunt. You know, if he doesn't at least speak for himself or have other people that are in on his side in his camp speak for him to defend him, that's questionable. Do. You all right, I have an idea. Let's let's see what the average Joe thinks. I can let me grab one of these drunk assholes and see what they think. <laughs> you, want, you want to hear that? All right, but this is not a very scientific poll. <laughs> I'll just say that let's, right now. Let's do let's do it. Uh, I'll be right back. I'm gonna grab <laughs> grab one of them. Grab a drunk asshole. All right. <clears throat> All right. He's debating if he wants to do it or not. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. All right, let's move in. Let's move into Space Force. All right. Well, before we get to Space Force, I think this is important to to <clears throat> to, to talk about, and it's this spending bill because yeah, we yeah, that's, been, that's what I wanted to yeah, say. Yeah, we, we've, yeah, we've been we've been talking about you know the impeachment and you know what the ramifications are and like you know how this hurts the party. And I think one thing that's just recently come out that's that's pretty fucking big um, that affects literally everyone. Uh, is this spending bill because, you know, all right, there might be some negative backlash coming out around this impeachment. You know, Nancy Pelosi feels like she has to have a win for her, you know, uh, folks that have to go home and, and people that are in, you know, these swing states that might get voted out because they've just voted to impeach the president. And so we have this giant, largely bipartisan uh, uh, spending bill that amounts to the tune of like $1.4 trillion, 
which is huge. And uh, there's definitely things that I want to dig into. Space Force is, is probably the biggest one that I want to talk about. But yeah, that's a good segue. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about the uh, the NDAA, the um, the National Defense Authorization Act, because Absolutely, you know yeah. while all these you know while impeachment was going on, it's been overshadowing a lot of other things that have been slipping through the cracks. And some of those things include things like the Afghanistan papers, which, you know, no one's really talking about because impeachment's dominating the news. Um, I think the National Defense Authorization Act um, that Trump signed is fucking a really big deal. And no one's debating this. Like, you're not finding this. You're you're not finding any debates on how big of a package this thing is. And well, it's, it's, it's massive, and, and, it, and it does so many things. I mean, if, if you're just it just lumping in the NDAA with the, the general, like I think they're calling it a minibus spending bill for the rest of this fiscal year. I mean, we're talking about raises for federal workers, election security, Head Start program, medical research, census funding, defense, of course, flood insurance. They've given a raise to the um, raises to not only federal workers, but the largest raise to to uh, service members. Um there's they're funding a gun uh, um, uh, uh, research, uh, gun violence research. Um, oh, uh, the the bit about um, uh, family leave for um, paid family leave for federal workers. I mean, this thing, this bill is massive. There's a there's a bonus. There's a bonus for for troops serving in Afghanistan. I thought right. there's a bonus um, there. This this thing. When I was looking at this thing, I was like, I don't even know where to begin reading this. This bill is humongous, mon- humongous bill. And the crazy um, thing about it is, it's got something for everyone, right? It's not just yeah. like like liberal spending for liberal programs. It's like no, literally it's for, has something for everybody in this. It's crazy. So so. Um, so it, this this defense bill basically authorized seven seven hundred and thirty eight billion dollars for the fiscal year of twenty twenty, and that's for the and next I, nine months. To be that's clear, for, yeah, that's for it's the not next even for the whole months. year. It's the next nine months. Um, it, it includes what a three point one percent pay increase for troops. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, first paid federal work. funding. Uh, one for, point I think is one point three state, billion dollars to the border wall, is in there. Uh, and what's and what happens with these with these huge bills? So they need a they're bipartisan because there's something in there for everyone, you know. Right, so right. there's some you know for the for the right wing guys, they get their military spending, they get their um, border wall, they get they their get border their, wall, and yeah. then the left wing people get their research on gun violence and stuff like that. And it's it's uh, I saw another thing that's going to in the bill that would increase immigration or green line immigration from Liberia as well. That's an interesting I was looking, I was looking at that as well. <laughs> I, I don't really understand the full context of that, but I think that there we'll have was to all, dig into that later, we'll have to I dig guess. into that as well. But I know that was part of it. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there with the F 35. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I think it's in, as far as approving parts and, um, it, it, there is there is a shit line. Uh, there is a I think a billion a billion dollars allocated to a, a helicopter, a new helicopter. A helicopter. Uh, yeah. Nice. The um, it was the the AH sixty four E helicopters. Um, so it was a it was a billion dollar request for the for those helicopters, and then there was a two billion dollar request for the uh, Boeing. Um, the, the the Boeing uh, F A eighteen E and then Super Hornet fighters, um, and then the there's a bunch of Boeing jets. There's a Boeing bomber in there as well. All these fucking aerospace companies are raking it in um, between Boeing, uh, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin. Of course, mm-hmm. they are. You know, this is just welfare for these companies when you think about it, because these com- the way that the reason why they're they're so lucrative and, and and what makes the you know military industrial complex so kind of. It, it makes it such a kind of like a brilliant system for the people who are profiting. The way that they set this up is that they build out different parts in all these different states, so it's impossible not to improve. It's 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 impossible they, to they, reject they, them. It's, right? it's impossible to reject them, and they also supplement other industries around them. So, you know, it, General Dynamics or Lockheed Martin or or Raytheon, they don't just affect. They supplement the industries that are surrounding them. So, like, you know, when you're trying to find a place to build 
a, uh, a jet plane, you need to make sure that there's you know solid transportation, there's logistical support, and right. that there's other industries around there that support that you know your industry like but not you, but not always though because sometimes they put shit in really weird places yeah. just for political reasons and yeah and that's what makes the aerospace you know for the the military the defense industry so it's an anomaly because they're not a lot of times they're not doing it for those specific reasons like like look for example let's just say if you're going to build a if you're going to build a food processing plant mm-hmm. and if you're looking for a place to build a food processing plant and create jobs you need to pick a place that has access to water, that has clean water systems for right. a food process. Uh, right. Nuclear nuclear energy would be something too. You need access to water for the cool down systems and stuff like that. Right. There's a lot of there's a lot of reasons why different states or different areas have different industries localized in them. Is because their geography or their local economy or their workforce, their labor force are able to work in those jobs or they're able to, it's, it's more cost effective for those com- for those industries or those companies to um, have like a logistical connection with each other. Right. So that's why, that's how you choose to, 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 to build a factory somewhere. And also it has to do with tax benefits and stuff like that, of course. But, you know, where is that business going to thrive? With the defense industry, they're just trying to throw as much shit and kind of be convoluted and in many different political districts as possible. So a congressman can't say no. You know, you, you have to say yes, because it's it's going to be hurting the, the job market there. And when you do that, it's never good. I mean, Bernie Sanders is a very left wing guy. Generally, Bernie Sanders has been, I would say, somebody who's a lot more concerned about investing in things like inf- well not so much infrastructure but healthcare and all that stuff and social programs definitely and infrastructure uh, as well but infrastructure yeah. cell healthcare and all that stuff now bernie sanders is a supporter of the f35 project the most expensive military project of all time and the most controversial military project of all time uh, besides maybe the manhattan project because the thing does the, the f35 has had a lot of problems in production, it's been late. It has a lot of problems with the helmet, the parts. I mean, you name it. There's a lot of things that are wrong with the F-35. Now, they fixed a lot of issues with the F-35. But now that jet's just being straight up used as kind of like a way to, 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 to you know, w- w- the biggest exporter that we have is the aerospace industry. Like, that's the biggest exporter within America is the aerospace industry. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're exporting these billion-dollar planes, these, these, these planes that cost $250 million a unit in, in packages of about 45, like, squadrons, because they sell planes in squadrons. Right. You don't so just sell one of these bitches. You don't sell pla- You sell planes in squadrons, and then, um, you know, the l- let's just say if they sell a squadron of like maybe twenty planes, you know, th- then it will be up to the country to purchase an additional twenty after that, and then you pay as you receive them. You know what I mean? So the U.S. uses that as a way to balance out trade deficits. So you see that with Japan. Now Trump was in Japan. This was something that didn't really go that went under notice, but. You know, there was a big deal with Japan in the United States as far as them purchasing a lot of F-35s. Now, does Japan want those planes? I mean, there was a pilot who died in the F-35 uh, not so long before, a Japanese pilot, not so long before the deal, the ink was signed on the deal. Right. What happened is that I think that they purchased that. Uh, they bought those F-35s mainly because they wanted to balance out a trade deficit. And also because they were also working with a deal with Iran, with, um, because they want to continue buying pur- purchasing oil from Iran. And Rouhani, as we speak, is actually in Japan. He won't be there right now, but they're trying to iron out some deals where they can get some sanction relief. I don't know. Did you know that Rouhani Rouhani's in uh, Japan right now? I didn't actually know that, but yeah, that makes total they're, sense they're, given the situation on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 there and they're trying to figure it out because I think Japan is probably there. You know, Japan wants wants that market to be open because I mean, Japan open Japan sells a lot of stuff. It's not just because they want to buy oil. They buy about thir- they they perch they were purchasing three percent of their oil from Iran. Um, they they import all of their oil. Japan has zero oil in that country, so they have to they they, they depend on the Middle East. So they're trying. 
uh, to not only because three percent of their oil anyway, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you still have to make that oil up. Like that, you still like that's still three percent of the market's gone for you. You have to find other suppliers to make that up. Japan also wants that market open because they make a lot of stuff. Japan is not like China where they're you know making fucking uh, tote bags and and in uh, shoes they're creating high-end expensive products that are that are you know tens of thousands of dollars like cars and computer systems right. and so, like advanced software systems video games and all that stuff they want to sell that stuff to iran like they want to sell japanese cars in iran they want to sell co- toyotas and, and and hondas and and cameras and video game systems and you know all these expensive finished goods so they they want those markets open, and you can't blame them. So they're trying to iron out a deal right now. But I guess the point, I kind of went off the rails a little bit on that. But the point I'm trying to make is that they're using the F-35 and these expensive planes not necessarily as a military operation. Like, for, for military purposes, they're using it for political leverage over other countries to balance out trade deficits. Does that's, that make sense? Yeah, right. no, that's a very astute observation. And, you know, I guess... Um, a party to this defense bill right obviously we're injecting crazy amounts of money into uh defense and as you pointed out you know building a new helicopter and stuff like that so this is propping up you know our internal uh uh, industries people like boeing and lockheed martin raytheon stuff like that which obviously promotes a lot for our economy but you know really the question is like okay cool raytheon makes a ton of money boeing makes a ton of money but are they necessarily producing back into the economy and that's that's kind of the the open question there. Um, I think, generally speaking, I'd say no. But uh, yeah, I mean this 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 bill is 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 it's really really big. It's really really big. It's and, almost and, too and big I, to dive into it, in a single episode. Yeah, it's yeah. too it's too big to dive into. I was reading it earlier today, and I, I spent some time reading it the other day as well. And I was like, there's just so much stuff in here. And again. Um, you know, if you're if you're on a conservative point of view, in, you know, you, you know, a lot of our conservatives are like, yeah, let's increase military spending. Well, even if you're if you're going to go with that logic, you had to compromise a lot of things as well to get that bill in place, because there's a lot of things that are in that bill that are against a lot of your your uh, your um you know, political initiatives. And this so, is, this I, is really probably upsetting a whole lot of like libertarians and fiscal conservatives because it's blowing up the federal be- uh, uh, deficit here. You know, this is deficit spending 101 right now. You know, we are spending a ton of money. Now, <clears throat> see, I'm not necessarily a proponent of like super small government. We should cut the shit out of everything. I think we should definitely reorganize well, that's what I'm here that's what I'm here for yeah <laughs> I definitely think we should reorganize the way we spend money but I I don't necessarily disagree with the idea of spending money it's just like what are we spending money on you know and like how do we spend money and are we efficient at our spending I guess that you know just raises a bunch of questions and I, I think this might be a really good segue to talk about because included in this uh, uh the defense spending portion of it is the creation of a space force yeah, the space the space force and one and one last thing. Rand Paul um, had a, a. He's probably a, freaking out. <laughs> Rand Paul Rand Paul voted against it, obviously, yeah. <laughs> and he said uh, he made a really good point. Um, you know, he he said that um, if you want forty billion dollars in new defense spending, then you have to give the other side forty billion dollars in new domestic spending, and that's the nature of today's bipartisanship. You can have your money as long as we get our money. And I thought that was like a really, really kind of insightful thing that he said about mm-hmm. the spending and how, how it works. I'm curious. So, what do you, what's your take on that, though? Do you think that that's a good thing or a bad thing? Me? Yeah. I think it's bad. Why? The, 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 the keep on spending money like that? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, do you, that, that, I literally think that. that. I like, think tell I, me why. I, yeah. I think it's. I don't. It's it's gloat. It's it's glo- like I don't. I don't endorse any of these domestic social programs. You know that. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm very small government type of dude who wants to decrease spending. And also, 
I don't support the increased defense spending. And the main reason why is because just because you have the most expensive military doesn't mean that you have the best military. Like a lot of these things are more expensive than they should be. So, no, I, I'm, I'm completely against the bill. There's no need to be spending this much money. There's no there's no need to be increasing the our debt that much, borrowing money to eventually want to fight China. <laughs> like basically <laughs> we're borrowing money for the geopolitical threat of China in the future. And at the same time, we're borrowing money from them the fight against them for the chance of the fighting against them. That's, that's kind of funny when you think about it, because that's what, that's what this space force program, I think a lot of the justification for space force is actually the future geopolitical threat of China and China's endeavors in the space. And not just China, so, but also Russia, Russia and China both already have space forces. China and Russia both have space forces, but let's let's just be completely clear china is way it's is to realist in foreign policy they see china as a much greater threat in the future than russia russia's economy is about the size of like new jersey's economy or something <laughs> like that no really like i'm not making yeah. fun of it like yeah. their 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 economy is much much smaller than the united states china China's economy is will surpass the U.S.'s economy, right? But ec- economics aside, Russia still also has capabilities that are threatening. Militarily, to, in space, Russia in mil- militarily Russia is probably a bigger threat. But China, economically, they are a much bigger competitor than any other country in the world. Yeah, nat- the naturally, States. naturally. But naturally. I think you know when, when we put up the space force, at least part of it, you know, is. Um, securing assets in space, right? And if you look at the two countries that are most threatening to us, that are most likely to threaten our ass, uh, assets in space, you have to include Russia. You know, right, their economy aside, you know. Let's let's go on. Let's talk about this thing because sure. I'm having trouble understanding what exactly this is. I sure. don't know too much about it, but I was listening to this guy, this think tank. You know how these think tanks are. You ever listen to these think tank lectures? Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> um, they're all insufferable. That's why I stop going to think tanks, or I don't attend think tanks, or <laughs> no longer members of the think tanks that I was part of. Um, there was this guy by the name of uh, Stephen Quast. Uh, the urgent need for a U.S. space force. It was out of Hillsdale College. I would. It's a YouTube video, and I was listening to that earlier today. And basically, big proponent. He's a former Bush speechwriter. This guy, so you know, or he's a former Bush guy. Take it or leave it. <laughs> so yeah, you, you, you kind of know who he is, yeah. <laughs> but just by that. But basically, he goes on this huge rant about how. He's like, you know, the British lost so many soldiers in World War One is because they concentrated too much on their Navy. Mm. Uh, you know, they weren't able to foresee the techno- technological changes that would help them on the battlefield. And then he goes on about something you'd be interested in. He's like, the Sherman tank. Was <laughs> a disa- he starts talking about Sherman tanks for right. like 10 minutes about mm-hmm. how. The U.S. sent all these tank operators to their deaths because Sherman tanks were Sucked. basically blown to smithereens <laughs> by yeah. Panzers. Uh, you know, the Sherman tank, they took about, what, five to seven Sherman tanks to destroy a Panzer because mm, right, on the, shells would belt, but the, the shells would, would bounce off the armor and they would have to... The one Basically Sherman tank them, would yeah. have to get behind it and shoot shoot the shoot it with a shell where the armor was weak to destroy it. So you had a lot of dead Sherman tank operators, which was a, which was really bad. But you know the, the the strategy was to swarm them. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't mm-hmm. to overmatch them. Um, but he was comparing it like to, to that that you know the U.S. lost a lot of guys because um, we didn't have the foresight or we put our people in with with uh you know bad technology and the space force is going to is like that next battle against china because china will be will have a you know they've met all of their requirements over the past 20 years or so when it comes to the space their their space initiatives and then he was talking about them stealing data like like china is going to be able to steal everyone's data easily when they get their space force up and running this mm-hmm. this zap out all the all the all the 
um, intellectual property and you know all these company secrets and you're going to be able to just advance super like really fast and granted china does do that they do steal private information from companies and they use it to build their own shittier version of things <laughs> let's let's <How> a... <laughs> all right all right let's let's not get too ahead of ourselves let's let's parse this a little bit back uh i've sent you a link and cast this is what i've been going off of to start this is the um the fact sheet that was sent out by the Department of Defense on the United States Space Force. And I'd like to read a little bit of it for our yeah, listeners. Yeah, let's go over it because mm-hmm. I don't know exactly. Because it sounds like... It sounds crazy a shit. A movie. It <laughs> yeah. sounds like a movie. Yeah, like, it sounds, it crazy sounds shit. like a fucking movie. Like a B-rated movie. Uh-huh. Like, oh, you've seen Space Force? Well, all right. So, full disclosure, I'm actually a supporter of it. Um, I actually don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's quite a good idea. Um, well, prob- your probably not for the same reasons that, like, you know, Trump, I'm, Trump or Warhawks want it. I'm an ignoramus, like, so mm-hmm. it's time for you to sell me on it then. All right, cool. So let's let's read from this uh, um, fact sheet. We can start all the way at the top in the strategic context, right? And all right, so it starts off by saying the national defense strategy recognizes great power competition as the central challenge to U.S. national security. Space is a vital national interest and critical domain in which this competition will occur. Second point, the United States faces serious and growing challenges to its freedom to operate in space. China and Russia, note they actually point out Russia here, view counter space capabilities as a means to reduce U.S. and allied military effectiveness. Simultaneously, uh, commercial entities are developing and delivering new space technologies and capabilities at a speed never before seen. U.S. interests in space are expanding. Uh, This new security uh, environment highlights the role of space in the changing character of warfare and presents new challenges and opportunities to the United States military to maintain our comparative advantage in space. Yeah, comparative advantage in space. We must adopt the to the changing environment. No branch in the armed forces has been created since the United States Air Force was established in 1947, over 70 years ago. The world has changed significantly in that time. Reforming the organization of our military space enterprise is fundamental to transforming our approach to the space domain. Okay, so let me parse this back and, and speak non-fucking Department of Defense for you. So the first point talks uh, a lot about just kind of setting the stage. Henry, right now, uh, in regular geopolitics, how we conduct ourselves militarily especially, but also just you know um, diplomatically, depends on where our uh where our assets where our interests lie right so we're in the middle east maybe for oil who knows you know we're in you know different conflicts all over the world they all stem from a a desire or a need to secure or um or acquire assets would would you agree with that yeah um you do your geopolitical interest is based on your your assets in that area either your um you know state assets or Mm -hmm. resources there cool and then they go on to say that you know countries like china and russia they have these counter space capabilities right and so what they're talking about there specifically is asat missiles right so asat missiles are anti-satellite missiles um we have them too but like china and russia are both developing and own missiles that can literally shoot a a gps satellite out the sky if they wanted to right this is a capability that exists right now it's not like this far-flunged idea it's actually not hard to do you know we've done it from we've we've shot down our own um you know uh satellites just for for research purposes you know with planes you know like this is something that we can totally do and i think that When we're talking about what the geopolitical interest is in space, it's honestly those assets. GPS uh, um, is like, I can't underscore this enough. Literally everything you do or many things that you do in life uses GPS or at least is supported by GPS. So we're talking about everything from, you know, buying your damn things on Amazon and tracking the shipping, you know, to, you know, getting directions to go places, but also a lot of the infrastructure around, you know, all of our things, right? Uh, our internet, communications, uh, cell phones, you name it, all that stuff. The, the fact that we're doing right now a podcast in two separate locations over the internet, you know, this has to do with the satellites that are orbiting us right now. And so 
when we when we think about China and Russia having these capabilities, and to be very clear, so do we, right? We have to understand that if the threat is there, you know, it needs to be addressed, and that that's where they're they're kind of setting up this stage here. I think it's a little bit, you know, um, fear mongery, you know, to specifically name China and Russia. You know, I think you can make that argument for almost any advanced military can come up with these capabilities, but I think they're trying to fear monger and maybe play to the war hawks a little bit here. Um, but those well, are definitely the two that that you have to watch. You because know? China and Russia are the two countries that have the capabilities to do it that are not under basic the... They're not inside the U.S. empire, basically. Right, like but, They're not part of the U.S. It's not, empire. It's, it's, not, it's not a far-flung idea to think that India or Pakistan or Israel or, you know, any of these other, like, you know, advanced militaries could have, could secure this capability as well. It's not, I mean, it literally is rocket science, but if rocket science shouldn't scare you. It's actually not that, it's not that hard, right? So, like, any advanced military in the world including North Korea, could probably do something similar, you know? Um, any advanced military can come up with these, these capabilities, and it would severely cripple not only military operations, because obviously we rely on, you know, our mil- our satellites to monitor the ground, see what troop formations, you know, see if you're building a fucking nuclear bomb, you know, uh, uh, help organize troop deployments on the ground, you know, help airplanes navigate, things like that. But also just general civilian consumer like our our global economy is powered by these satellites right so <clears throat> that's the threat and they're trying to address this threat with a unified space force so they say that you know one of the next points is that uh you know the commercial entities are developing and de- delivering these new technologies so we look at like elon musk for example i think he sent up something like 60 brand new satellites into space in the last few months and it's massively much, much faster than anything that we've experienced before. And the reason why we're putting up so many satellites into space is because our growing demand for communications, right? You know, everybody wants their FaceTime and their WhatsApp and their, you know, uh, uh, they want to be able to buy things and sell things and they want to navigate and they want their smart homes and all this shit. All that requires a lot of infrastructure in space. And our commercial entities are definitely taking taking advantage of that. Were you familiar with that before? No, I, I no, I, I was familiar with that. Like, you know, my familiarity of it is that a lot of this stuff is being taken care of by the private sector. What what specifically is being taken care of by the private well, sector? Well, like a lot of the a lot <laughs> of the plans that go into space are by by private companies like um, what what's. Elon Musk, SpaceX, space company. SpaceX, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Blue, from, yeah, um, Blue Origin, SpaceX, mm-hmm. um, people like that, right? People, people like that. Like, if it's privately being taken care of, you know, why do we need to take a? Why do we need to make a branch of government to do it? Well, so that's that's a really good question. So while the operations, right? While Elon Musk is sending up a bunch of satellites and shit, <clears throat> and that's a that's a commercial entity, that's a private institution, who's protecting those things and who's coordinating those satellites you might not know this but you know um the united states military you know plays a huge and integral role in making sure that fucking satellites don't crash into each other right so there's a specific branch of the air force space command whose only job it is is to monitor all of the shit in space and calculate their trajectories and make sure that they don't crash into each other space is a big place the earth is a big place but the rate that we're sending satellites and things into necessitates that a central unit pays attention to where they all are and where they're going and make sure they don't crash into each other because that would be disastrous so that's the air force that's doing that right now the air force space command a, a division of the space command is literally just dedicated to making sure satellites don't crash into each other it's like it's kind of like how we have um uh uh, the uh oh shit what what am i air traffic control here you know like right now you know this the sky is a big place right you don't think that you know airplanes would crash into each other because they're you know it's the fucking sky right but like without air traffic control for example Planes would crash into each other. Like, shit would go haywire eventually, right? And that would be disastrous, right? Nobody would want to fly if, if there was even a little bit of a threat that maybe 
Maybe you crash into another plane, or maybe you can't land in time because there's so much traffic on the ground, right? And you can't do that safely. Like you can imagine like one airplane, you know, crashes and, and it's news for, for weeks, you know? Can you imagine if that just happened regularly? Like nobody would want to fly. Well, you know, you know, it's interesting. Have you ever seen the movie Gravity? Yeah, hell yeah. Um, that's a really good movie. That's a really great example. I want to talk about a specific from that. I think you might be bringing it up, but go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I am bringing it up. So when there's a when there's a satellite collision, the debris from the from the satellite is forever in orbit, right? Correct. And that's space junk, right? And that's a serious threat that is also being addressed by this idea of a space force. Now, currently, we don't have really great plans on dealing with space junk. And if there's enough, if there's a critical mass of space junk, we might not even be able to go to space anymore. Meaning, so for those of you who didn't watch Gravity, Gravity's crazy ass movie. You know, I think it's Sandra Bullock, right? Is the S- Sandra Bullock and George Clooney? Mm-hmm. So they're up in space, and like this big issue happens where you know these. Uh, satellites, they crash into each other, right? And satellites are moving fucking fast, right? Like tens of thousands of miles per hour, you know, orbiting the planet. Really incredible stuff. It's it's all a crazy balancing act that they do. And in this in the movie, they crash into each other and it causes this giant cloud of debris. Now, thing that you need to know about physics and space is that in space, shit doesn't slow it's down. It's not real. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> shit doesn't it's slow down. It's a in conspiracy. Space. You know, like you could throw a football in space, and that football will keep going forever until something you know impedes it, until it hits something, right? Because there's no there's no air resistance, there's no gravity that's holding on to it. It'll just keep wrapping around the planet at tens of thousands of miles per hour, and at that speed, I mean, we're talking about like in a tornado a pebble could like cut through a cinder block. You know what I mean? Moving at those speeds. Now magnify that by orders of magnitude, just much, much faster. One satellite explodes, the debris from that satellite could destroy other satellites or even space stations or even people that are in space at the time, right? They're like little micro meteors and they're flying in space and it can wipe out pretty much everything we know and love about our current you know, way of life, you know, that, that is, that is predicated and dominated by space satellites. So even if you cut out Russia and China and, you know, oh, we're just being boogeymans and shit like that. And we're just warmongering here. Even if you cut that part out, we still need really smart people and really a a centralized location where we could track just the movements of satellites and make sure that everything up there is going to operate perfectly. I, you know, air traffic control sometimes gets a bad rap when you're, you know, it's the holiday season and people are flying around and maybe they're delayed on the tarmac every now and again. But one, I'm going to give a shout out to the air traffic control of, of the United States and, and all over the world. You know, what they do is super important and, and you know, it makes it enables us to to fly and 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 makes our world just a little bit smaller by giving us you know the ability to move around safely and and this is just an extension of that that i think needs some serious uh, um attention but but not the tsa though right fuck the tsa <laughs> yeah, <fuck. laughs> uh, side tangent i you know my last name is abdel jabbar so you know I've had some experiences where I've I've had to you know get He's some randomly checked a, a lot. A, yes, uh, I've been randomly checked quite a few times. You know, it's you know I always comply, of course, because part of me is just terrified, and the other part of me is just like, all right, they're just doing their job. Don't you know? Don't make a fuss about it. But um, yeah, I mean, like, this is a necessary thing. <clears throat> no, I I mean I listen. I am no. I know. I have a very you know, I barely know that the Earth is round. <laughs> I, I can barely explain that the Earth is round. Um, I can. You asked me once. <laughs> I know. I did that. I did that just as a joke because so the the there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, the Earth is round, but like they wouldn't. They they know that the Earth is round, but they're they're not able to explain like the, that to somebody who's really stupid and believes that the Earth is flat. Um, so I, it was just kind of like. A lesson like you know you should know some basic elementary science is important but um no i i definitely um understand the threat of the ricocheting satellites because 
when one satellite hits another sat like it also causes like a ricochet effect right like, correct because it, <clears throat> since they're forever in orbit like they can keep on hitting other satellites exactly and then it can be mm -hmm. like a like a you can basically create like a like a saturn type ring mm -hmm. a, around so yeah like of course i'm all for cleaning that stuff up but like can't that can't like a space garbage man is that what if you, if you want to call them like it would be space garbage man like space sanitization well i mean is, honestly is that, just like, that, just being like, frank can you, like can we you, should you, have can that you, can you clean that stuff up like can, is it possible to clean that up if it's moving at those speeds <clears throat> we're, we're working on it man uh right now there's like a bunch of proposals and a bunch of like new uh research that's going into how to how to deal with space junk um and part of that part of that and this is like the environmentalist in me is like making sure that we don't create space junk first right like that's the biggest part of the battle and right now we don't have great protocols on like what to do with satellites that are like they've extended past their lifespan you know when a satellite is out of commission when it runs out of like fuel to like you know maneuver itself and shit you know uh we need to do something about them and you know right now we don't have many options like most of the time we do a controlled burn where we just send it back into earth like we literally just like make it go make it fall into earth and like most of the time all of it gets burnt up in the atmosphere on entry right like it just burns up but there's still like parts of it that survive and could cause danger <laughs> you know to you know the people that are under it right and that could be very dangerous um there are some um some plans on like some technology where we send another sp satellite up that has like a fucking net and it's just like nets an old satellite and then you know does something with it like safely brings it down instead of just like randomly bringing it down into earth you know um so that's like the big hurdle that we have to do we have to figure out how do we you know how do we safely and effectively bring these these things down but ultimately bringing it back to defense right why okay so the question that people would argue against space forces like well all right we don't need a military branch to do this we just you know the private sector can figure this out we'll just use technology to to you know figure out space junk and all that stuff and that's a fair point but you know when it comes down to it you know if we assume that there will never be a conflict in space then sure private sector can probably take care of it we can probably you know science the shit out of it and it'll be fine but the likelihood that that nothing happens in space militarily is is like i think it's a little naive you know i think it's a little so, naive to believe that that china or even us shit i'm not precluding the u.s from shooting a chinese you know spy satellite out of the sky i, f I feel like we, we would totally do that you know well are there space muslims there the then there, there's a reason to go bomb space. <laughs> oh, no. There's um, space Muslims coming. Yeah, I don't, um, don't want to get you, you in trouble with that one. <laughs> you, ever, you, ever read, you ever read the book Dune? Uh, no, I never read it. No. It's basically about space Muslims. That's crazy. Um, it, was written, it was written in the 50s and 60s, though. It's like not, they're not Muslims, but it's like highly influenced by Islam. And like the, the, the it's it's interesting now um so what does a space war look like like or just like satellites shooting laser beams at each other like pew 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 pew, pew. <laughs> like is that what it is that, that's like what i kind of imagine it. it's uh, not i hate like... to disappoint you but if uh, space satellites were shooting laser beams you wouldn't hear a thing because there's no air in space to hear anything so it would be very quiet and boring i've seen star <clears throat> wars there's, there's <laughs> pew, 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 pew. have you seen the new so... star wars though that's the question I have not seen it. Uh, I, neither have I. Funny, funny story. So I was, um, I don't really, I, I haven't really liked the the past couple of Star Wars. So I kind of, I'm still kind of invested in the overall story though. Like who isn't? It's right. like, you know, Star Wars. So I, I was like, I don't really feel like seeing a movie, but I want to know what happens. So I'm in the car. I'm in a cab with my friends. And you better like, not spoil uh, anything. I'll fucking kill you. I'm not going to say anything, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I was like, guys, do you, I just want to, do you care if I just like read out what happens in star Wars? And I was like, no, I don't care. And I asked the cab driver. I'm like, I'm like, Hey, excuse me. Like, um, we're, I'm about to give you star Wars spoilers. I'm looking up the ending of what happened. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm like, excuse me. He's like, not listening to me. Like, I don't want to ruin star Wars for you. And he's like, what's the, what what is Star Wars? <laughs> it, was, it was like what's Star Wars, and I was like, all right, never. It's like he doesn't care. But um, besides the point, so 
All right. There's no laser beam sounds. No, no Shame. laser beam sounds. But I mean, the the real warfare, at least in the in the immediate future, in space would be uh, a country, whether that be China or Russia or even ourselves, using ASAT missiles, so anti satellite missiles, to knock, to destroy satellites or other assets in space, um, to greatly diminish you know their adversary's ability to you know uh, operate either on the ground or economically uh you know militarily otherwise right so imagine like this scenario we're getting into a trade war with china that shit escalates we're not getting like we're not getting anywhere with it um we don't want to do a ground war because china's got these anti-ship missiles that we talked about before and we both have nukes so we're not going to nuke each other um but one way that china thinks hey this might be a good idea is like hey they say we no longer want any satellites in orbit above china because that's a breach of our sovereignty or something like that and of course we don't comply uh and then china says all right well fuck you guys then and then they launch their anti-satellite missile and they explode a couple of our gps satellites you know maybe it causes some issues you know with our operations in the area you know, maybe it um, causes some economic downturn because now we have fewer satellites in orbit that, you know, enable us to do communications for, say, just basic commerce, you know. Um, maybe there's really bad implications and, you know, blowing up a couple of satellites means a bunch of space junk that then destroys even more satellites, maybe runaway, you know, uh, things like that. So that would be the real conflict. I guess one way that we could mitigate that would be to have assets in space that would defend other space-based entities. So uh, you talked about lasers, right? So maybe it wouldn't be like two satellites shooting lasers at each other, but maybe it could be a satellite that's armed with a laser that could destroy an anti-satellite missile before it has an opportunity to destroy other satellites. That could be a possibility. That sounds pretty cool. So just lasers and missile, space missiles? La lasers and space missiles now what's what's troubling about this and what might not be legal about this is that you know us russia china and pretty much every spacefaring country in the world you know has adopted you know a resolution by the general assembly of the united nations which prohibits uh the weaponization of space right and it specifically talks about nuclear but i think it's pretty implicit that it means any uh, operations because you know article 4 talks about the requests of the committee on the p peaceful uses of outer space which is you know working on uh, um, agreements with one another uh, to develop space um, study things in outer space and like you know our origins and where's you know this the question of life like where does that all come from um, but it specifically calls out like not weaponizing space but you know the, the the question. I mean, I've, I've posed a, a hypothetical situation that seems at least pretty, you know, uh, um, plausible. You know, what do you do? Do you ignore the you know the treaty that was signed you know way back when in the sixties, sixty three specifically, or you know what? Another part of that treaty prohibits the um, the creation of space based military uh, outposts, including on the moon or other celestial bodies. Um, so right now we're bordering some shit, you know, and I think so where I like the Space Force is because I think that centralizing uh, like right now we're doing a bunch of things with, you know, the U.S. Uh, Air Force Space Command. We have some army operations uh, that does things in space. We also have intelligence agencies <clears throat> like the CIA that that, you know, heavily utilize space. And we have, you know, civilian entities like NASA. Uh, which have interests in space. And I think unifying a lot of those processes would, would actually make it more economically viable, but also it would allow the sharing of information a lot easier uh, so that you know, potentially we could, you know, promote um, more better technologies, you know, um, more satellites in space without them crashing into each other and so on and so forth, which is why I'm a proponent of this Space Force idea. However, on the other side, I don't love the idea of weaponizing space, you know, because I think that's a that's a runaway train. Um, the, the, the real question is like, you know, is this even going to be our choice? Right. Because countries like China and Russia, not to be a war hawk, but they do have these capabilities and they can do these things. And it is a threat, like whether you're, uh, you know, a, a war hawk or not is 
just it's just besides the point in my opinion do you know who we need to get on? We need. I want to get somebody on this show who can talk. Do you know? Are you familiar with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency? Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with it, but what about it? The N- the NGA. They're yeah. they're one of the intelligence, uh, one of the members of the U.S. intelligence community. I want to speak to somebody up there about what they do because what they're doing over there is that they're analyzing like satellite imagery and Correct. stuff like that. Now. Aren't we already doing that? Like, isn't like so? We're, we're already. We're, 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 let's just let's just go over some like kind of basic basic yep. facts because you, there's a lot of information out there and some a lot of it's kind of confusing. So, space wars. First first fact: space wars or space force. It should be called Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> sure no, we're that. not there yet. You're not there or yet. Star, star starship troopers. We're, we're still in our in our solar system. Like we we haven't gone very far yet. <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy rings better. So. It's not like, you know, X-Wings fighting each other with a Death Star. It's or like Starship Troopers, people invading bug aliens on the moon or something like that. Right. It's more of a battle of um, like space supremacy, like a spatial, spatial, the right word, solar system. Outer space um, supremacy. Out, outer, yeah. outer space supremacy. Mm-hmm. So we could protect our satellite assets. Right. Is that kind of like what it is in a nutshell? Yeah, like building it, plants to protect protect our asset, our space assets, which include mostly satellites. Like, is there anything else up there that's important? Uh, international space stations, international space, space telescopes, um, telescopes. You but know, satellites are things that, like, if we lost a satellite, then that's you know annoying. You know, if that's we lost that one the- satellite, that's annoying. If one satellite is destroyed and causes a uh, like a like a chain effect ricochet thing, as we described, that's uh, crit- catastrophic. That's catastrophic. It's terrible. Yeah. And I think well, one thing just to point out some history here, you know, one of those last points on the strategic concept um, uh, context of the fact sheet that we read off of the last point talks about how the armed forces, you know, created the United States Air Force. So m- a lot of people might not know this, but 70 years ago. All of our air operations were dominated by the United uh, States Army, right? The U.S. Army was in, con- in full control of the Air Force, uh, or at least our Air Forces, um, until we spun it off into its own thing. And now in the last 70 years, we have developed a the, the strongest uh, um, you know, Air Force in the world, right? Like hands down, strongest, most advanced, most technologically capable, best funded air force in the world you know and that was only over a span of 70 years you know uh it took us a really long time for us to get our navies and our armies to be there you know so there is a um an argument to be made about taking smaller um kind of disparate groups and formulating their own thing right so i I talked about this before right now the united states air force has the space command right but the united states air force is mostly concerned with shit like the f-35 <laughs> you know what i mean like like making bombers making planes making things like that if the united states air force was still under the army the likelihood that we have you know uh, uh accelerated the development of a lot of our aerial capabilities uh would have been pretty low you know because because the priorities are different right because the mission statements are different we also have things like this in Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, right? And they're using a lot of uh, satellites and things like that to monitor operations on the ground, right? This is a big part of their operation. Nevertheless, the CIA's mission directive and, and priorities are terrestrial in nature, meaning right here on the ground, right? Yeah, the satellites help them, but, you know, they're not, they don't have the funding to, say, defend their satellites against a Chinese missile by themselves, same thing with NASA. NASA's a civilian entity that's promoting space exploration and space travel, right? You mean the CIA, the CIA can't sell enough black market drugs to, to fund, to, to, to get anti-satellite missiles? You mean anti, anti-anti-satellite missiles? <laughs> anti-anti-satellite. So, so you mean uh, selling, selling cocaine from Nicaragua in, uh, in, L, in uh, South Central LA? It, no, it doesn't no, get I, them there? I, I mean, I think they can try. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly think they'll try, um, but no, no, I don't. I don't think that they'd have apt enough funding. I don't think that you know that's there. 
you know, and NASA, like I said, civilian based entity, you know, very peaceful organization, you know, but even NASA keeps getting budget cuts, you know, like uh, um, it, they don't have the capabilities there. And their mission statement isn't to defend space. It's to explore space. Right. So, you know, the the arguments, at least like rationally speaking, in my opinion, it seems to be for the creation of a, of a space force. I think it would be it would be. It would make it more attractive to go into the industry because there would be a unified thing. Uh, like, for example, West Point for, um, you know, for the army there, you know, like they have a, a an academy where you go, you know, to be an awesome army guy or girl. Right. The creation of a Space Force would necessitate a Space Force Academy, which is a net benefit for the world, in my opinion, because these are people who would be literally just studying space and and related you know engineering sciences you know uh physics things like that um you know for better or for worse I, I'm, I'm a peace-loving guy but you know the military really does you know put forward a lot of the technology and innovation that we take for granted every day i mean gps in and of itself is something that we take for granted and that is something that was developed out of necessity for the united states military and i think consolidating you know the effort in space around a you know a co-equal branch of the military makes sense to me for those reasons alone it's interesting i am a sucker for space exploration i will say that as libertarian as i am you know you always find those things that like well i'm interested in space <laughs> i really want to find out about other planets or find like ex I really do want to call, like put a project in place that we colonize mm -hmm. another planet in like four thousand years. <laughs> you, you ever see those projects yeah, like those yeah, colony yeah. ships? Yeah, where where it takes like forty thousand years for them to get there, but they'll they'll, they'll keep them having children in the colony ship until they get there, <laughs> which is like such a crazy concept. Here's a fun one uh, that we can end on um, that we didn't touch on at all. But all right, so we've got uh, the army, right? The army, you know, like out of necessity, the army is helpful for people on the ground because like, let's say Canada decides they want to invade us. We have an army that you know defends us against Canada's incursion. You know, we have um, uh, a navy, uh, you know, in the sense that like to protect our waters, right? Let's say, I don't know, fucking Mexico decides to send their Mexican submarines up to California. We have crazy amount of uh you know naval presence in that area that protects us from that and then we have the air force and of course you know let's say i don't know give me another country that's not against us right now uh let's say south africa decides to send some jets over to us well we've got you know um we've got airplanes that'll take them out of the sky before they're you know before they're a threat um now all of those players all of those situations are like human-made things but what happens if a meteor comes to Earth and threatens the whole world? Easy. You send Ben Affleck and Bruce Willis up there to destroy it. Right. But the thing is that we don't have a unified like defense force against that. And the That's Space why force, you send – what were they in the movie Armageddon? They, they were um, NASA. They were NASA. No, they were like drillers, or they were like oil drillers, yeah. or something like that. No, but they, I mean NASA sent them up though. They had a, they had a like a crash course on becoming astronauts, mm -hmm. and then they were I forgot what they were. Were they were like oil riggers or yeah, something yeah, like they're, that? They're they're dr miners or drillers or some shit like that. Yeah, but see the thing is like if we had a space force, we could start training for those eventualities now, you know, and like just have a dope dope defense against fucking planet killing asteroids. Hey, I'm more worried about volcanoes, man. <laughs> Zoltan's not. He's uh, boarding down them. <laughs> Dude, volcanoes are, I swear to God, we're going to be destroyed by a volcano. Like, <laughs> everyone has their own predictions of how mankind will end, and I'm predicting that a, a super volcano will engulf the world. How many times has, has the, the Earth been destroyed by, by volcanoes? Like six times or something like that? Yeah. It's been a lot. Volcanoes are the biggest. <laughs> I run for president on an anti-volcano <laughs> platform. <laughs> the volcanoes are coming. What's your plan? Well, number first plan is that you win in Hawaii. We will, we will we will shut 
We will put a lid on every volcano. <laughs> We're going <laughs> to dump a bunch of water from the ocean into all the volcanoes and just turn them off. Yeah, we're going to put John Goodman's fat ass in every volcano, and they'll be plugged. Um, I know it's pretty interesting. I mean, you make a pretty convincing case. It's something that I want to I want to stay on top of. It's an inter- it's like an interesting concept, and I I'm trying to take myself out of my normal mind state and try to think of like the you know the political geopolitical realist. Um, position like what that position would be and i understand what what you're saying is that it should be more important to defend our asset like these expensive assets that we're putting into space um if we can because future warfare would probably look like that more so than you know a million chinese men running uh, you know invading the beaches of of uh of new jersey new jersey or or laguna beach or whatever on the west coast so it's interesting. It's also kind of funny just because it's Trump mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's just Space Force and it's easy to kind of make that a kind of a punchline like Space Force, Donald <laughs> Trump, oh, Space Force. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I need to re- re- read, but I think you did a really good job expl- giving me, who's not the savviest person on stuff like this, a kind of a basic rundown of what it does. And I'm sure people who are listening think the same way is there anything else, is there anything else that you want to add about space force because i think we're coming we're over an hour and a half and i am starving yeah i guess maybe just not to not to um derail it a little bit but uh obviously there's a cost to everything you know they were asking for 72.4 million dollars uh to get about 200 personnel uh, and start up a headquarters, um, and they got forty million in this uh, defense budget. So pretty deep cut to that. Um, so uh, we'll see. We'll see how that. It's goes. expensive. Yeah. Space is expensive, apparently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Whatever happened to the moon base? Yeah, um, I haven't read anything new about that. That just sounds like another one of those um, random Trump ideas. Um, What's the closest planet to Earth that we could explore, like that we could put that's not Mars? Well, uh, well, I was just going to say Dr. Robert Zubrin would say it would be Mars. Um, okay, worth it. I don't want to go to Mars. Zero desire to go to go set foot on Mars. It looks like Antarctica, but red. Yeah, I mean, it kind of is. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's no other like planets that we can go on that would be anything like Earth any anywhere in our didn't we find the, the planets woods. though in like our sister solar like the solar system next to us yeah named, dude like, but the solar tell, tell what's that what's the planet called i mean we found plenty of exoplanets you know planets on other uh uh star systems you know but we're talking about like light years away it would take us i think something like 40 light years or something like that or more just to get to the nearest galaxy the nearest star system that has maybe uh, planets that look like ours or that function like ours, it, it makes a ton more sense just to work with what we got here. What do you think the chances are of us getting Neil deGrasse Tyson on this show? Oh, man. Um, I'm going to say 13%. I would love to get him on, but uh, I feel like he's expensive. <laughs> do you think he'd want money? I don't know. Maybe. Let's reach out to him. If any, we should reach out to we should reach out to him. You never know. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had presidential candidates That's true. on That's as, true. Of, as of last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I gotta break your balls a little bit. Oh, all right, Hit bro me. historians, bro historians. What's wrong with that, bro historians? <laughs> oh my god, that is. I'm sorry, Danny. I'm gonna be blunt. I cringed a little bit when you said bro historians. Hey man, I had it written got, down in the notes. He could have said something before. Oh my beforehand. god, <laughs> bro! Histo- We've never used that term ever. Well, in this podcast. I coined bro it. Historian. I coined it. All right. Bro, I got a text. I got a text from um, from Phil, uh-huh. um, and he's just quotation marks. He's, he's pro historians, and I was just like, oh my god, bro, guys! If you haven't listened to the last episode, Danny. Danny was like doing the intro and he's like to all you bro historians out there and I was like oh my bro we've never tell us tell us what you think about it maybe bro bro historians it's I thought it was clever 
<laughs> hey, listen, all you bro historians out there, I hope you enjoyed the episode. <laughs> my bro historians and my uh, bro debt historians. <laughs> we don't, we don't. Mi- <laughs> um, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, I hope you guys liked that interview as well. Um, some people have had some interesting things to say to me about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, same. <laughs> Needless to say, but yeah. hey, man. I thought he was a nice guy. Yeah, definitely. Um, he was definitely a really nice guy. Um, it was generous of Zoltan. Zoltan. All my friends are just like, Zoltan. <laughs> um, to, it was generous um, of him to give us his time. To, to give us his yeah. time. He's, he's running for president. Um, his, his campaign manager is uh, uh, Pratik Chogali, who's been a friend to the show um, and who will be on the show um, uh, probably again soon to talk about the election um he pratik is was on the show a couple of weeks ago uh to talk about from from his journey from being a neoconservative to a foreign policy realist but he's also a, a political statistician uh he, he's a political scientist and he does political stats so we're gonna have him predict uh some presidential stuff when it gets closer to the um to the, the DNC, caucuses to the, and stuff yeah. the caucuses and stuff like that um he predicts that trump's gonna lose um so I actually have a different opinion, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. I, I mean, I want to see what his theories are and how he's coming up with what he, what, what he thinks is going to happen, but that should be interesting. Um, also, let's see what else is going to be on the show agenda. Um, yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm going to reach out to him this week. <laughs> yeah. I, I know I really am. Yeah, I yeah. really am going to reach out totally to him. Should, yeah. uh, uh, see if he does it. I think it would just be hysterical if he did do it. Um, I don't know if I know anyone who knows him. <laughs> like, why would I know anyone who knows him? Mm-hmm. Um, but hey, we we we're somewhat of a podcast now. Like, we, there we definitely have are. No, 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 definitely our our growth we're, has been incredible. And and you know, thanks to all you bro historians out there for uh, <laughs> for sticking we're somewhat with us. of a podcast that people want to go on. <laughs> yeah. Like now, now it's more people reaching out to us to be on the show. For sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we. Um, yeah, any other guest ideas, let us know. Um, I want to get up on uh, some more presidential candidates. Mm-hmm. Um, as soon as we can. Talking right? to um, well, let's not Dan Byrne. Oh, I was going to say, uh, don't give it away. <laughs> okay. Um, then there's some other people, too. We'll cut that part out, yep. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, maybe some debates. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Debate, 2020 is going to be a big year debate yeah 2020 will be a pretty good year for this show because of all the politics that are going on i think and then skits i am writing skits again for the show and i have some pretty bizarre crazy ideas about some funny skits like the old intro skits or commercials i can't wait to bring i can't wait to bring that back i have some (laughs) ridiculous ideas and it's going to be like an overarching story that lasts like you you're, you're it's going to be like a musical almost like you're they're going to they're going to make a, mu- a broadway play off these skits yeah <laughs> i'll tell you about my ideas uh, uh Later. after this yeah. but it's going to be really funny all right. all right um everyone rate and review the podcast that is the number one way to help grow our show uh thanks for everyone who's been rating and reviewing it lately but yeah, rate and review the podcast. We are at like 200 something right now. Um, we want to hit the 300 mark because uh, it just, it just, just think looks about good. Po- <laughs> for other podcasters out there who are listening. So it's all about impressions. So the more people who see the, the, the podcast and the more ratings you have, it makes a more, uh, more likely the person's going to listen to it. Uh, and play it, and then if they listen to it and play it, it's more likely they're going to have their life completely changed by our such nuanced opinions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but rate and review the podcast, please, if you haven't already. It really does help. And then uh, we will see you. See you next year. <laughs> next decade. Oh, God, we're gonna get. So, I'm gonna get so much of that tomorrow. Yeah. See you next year. <laughs> Yeah, see you next year. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Peace. Peace.